Yes, hello everyone. It's half past 11, so we start with session 60 of the Polis uh, Conference on Smart City and Smart uh, Governance. Um, I have you a warm welcome. My name is uh, Tamara Goldstein. I work for the City of Helmond and uh, I'm co-chairing the New Mobility Services Initiative. Uh, today, I will share this meeting together with uh, my colleague Isabel Prohn. We were both involved in the Smart Race program. Uh, I will do the most of the speaking and Isabel uh, is uh, really helpful in, uh, the chat, uh, in the chat session. Um, then we can go to the next slide. Because this session is a joint effort of the EIT Urban Mobility and the New Mobility uh, Services uh, Initiative. The EIT Urban Mobility, you will uh, learn more about them uh, during this session. So I will now take the opportunity to inform you a bit about what New Mobility Services is. New Mobility Services Initiative is part of the EIT Urban Mobility and I'm co-sharing this with my colleague Edwin Mermans, who you will also see later on during this session. And what we aim with the new mobility services initiative, and what I think is also the essence of this smart city and smart governance session, is that we aim for large scale deployment of new mobility services, a smart green, on demand, shared, zero emission solutions to make our cities uh, better, cleaner, and more livable. What we not aim as NMS is a technology push, uh, but we are making a use of the opportunity new mobility services have uh, to deal with our real challenges in, uh, in our city. And I hope today uh, we as NMS, but also the other speakers, not only inform you, but also inspire you uh, to work on this real life implementations and uh, I hope we also see you after this session and we can work together to reach this purpose. Then, before we go to the really speakers, I have to do some housekeeping roles. And first of all is that, unfortunately, you all cannot ask questions. So for the questions, we use the chat session. You see that in the right top of your screen. Important to see that we have uh, two different types of chats. The event chat is for the whole Polis Congress event. The session chat, that's the place where you can ask your uh, Q&A, your questions and answer answers. Um, what I can say, uh, we have a full project program. So um, we might not have the opportunity to answer all your questions, but what we can promise is that we will leave in the uh, chat session, an email address. When you send all your questions we cannot deal with during the session to that email address, and we will take care of that. The questions will come to uh, the speaker for which the question is. Um, we will also use a poll. And also for the poll, you also can find at the right top of uh, your screen. And there also is the difference between chat and uh, uh, event and uh, a session poll. So please go to the session poll and the session chat. When you want to have a bigger screen to have a more detailed look on uh, the slides, you need to uh, double click on the presentation on, or on the speaker. Um, what you also see here is that, of course, we also have social media and Twitter. You can uh, use the uh, hashtag of the Polish conference and that is hashtag Polis20. And we also have a hashtag on this session and that is hashtag Polis6D. So um, please hear when you're really enthusiastic about what you hear uh, today. And then now we can go to the next slide to see uh, who our presenters are. Um, what you will see is that we have um, yeah, we have a long session and to make it um, doable for everyone to stay uh, connected, um, we have split it up. So we have a four, first session of four speakers within there, Marlene Brockvist Anderson from the city of Gothenburg, Mirjam Koopman from the province of uh, Gelderland, Sarah Torri 
from the University of Brussels and Florinda Pochetti for the EIT Urban Mobility. Um, after this four speakers, we will have the Q&A session. So we go from the one speaker to the next one. And um, after the Q&A session, my colleague Etienne Mermans will do a wrap up. And before we go to the speaker, the first speaker, I also will show you um, the uh, uh, second part of the session on the speakers. These are on the next slide. Uh, and here you see um, uh, Anna Dominic Albella from the IMAT initiative and she works from uh, Nissan. And then we have uh, some of the uh, NMS uh, action groups. And the first speak of that is Theo Tans uh, from AFA and Q Park. Danielle de Boer, she is leading our urban freight transport working group. Jesus de la Quintana from Technalia and Eleonora Finin of Charvet Digital Media. Also this session, we will end with the Q&A and with the poll. And also Edwin will do uh, the wrap up. So then now it's finally time to go to the first speaker. And the first speaker is Marlin Brookquist Anderson from the city of Gothenburg. And she will uh, tell us more about the Gothenburg Innovation Strategy for Electrification, Digitalization and Automation of the Urban Transport System. Yes, so, yeah, Marlin. Thank you very, very much, uh, Tamara. Uh, can you, uh, am I on? Yes, you are. OK, thanks a lot. You were talking about real life implementation and you were also talking about working together. And I think that is something very, very important, but it's also easy to say. It's quite difficult to, to do it, to come to uh, implementation. And this is what I would like to talk about today. And um, I just start my clock so I won't be over take too much, uh, too much time, but Gothenburg has a long and very broad experience in living labs, in test beds, and in demos in the urban transport system. We have uh, tested and demonstrated electric buses in an electricity collaboration, and we talk about that every, every time, so you probably know. But that is now being implemented and upscaled in the procurement of all city buses for the next 10 years in the city. And uh, next week, actually, the first 200 will be out in the streets. And that is a, quite an achievement, actually. But we have other demos, like Drive Me, the first uh, demo, uh, one of the first demos on automated private cars in, in Europe. We have Stadtleveransen, which is pretty well recognized, smart delivery city con uh, logistic concept. And UbiGo, uh, talking about Mars, UbiGo was one of the first full scale tests on Mars in 2016. So we've been taking part in developing new vehicle times, uh, types, self-driving waste trucks, the cargo bike armadillo, different concepts and business models. Um, many new IDs, though not all, have been upscaled and are now in commercial use in the city. So I want to share and I want to elaborate a little bit on my personal insights on this. So it's so important first to know where you're heading societal benefits must be in focus. And also innovation, though being a very creative process, needs a lot of structure. So one, as one of the first cities in Sweden, Gothenburg launched an innovation strategy for the city in 2017. And two years ago, the traffic committee asked the Urban Transport Administration to develop an innovation strategy for electrification, automation and digitalization. Uh, and in April this year, uh, the strategy was approved. And maybe we could sh uh, wait a little bit with the, with the slide. Yes, I think you took it away now. Yeah. Uh, so it's quite complex pictures. So I want to show it in the end, actually. Uh, well, the, this strategy, our innovation strategy at the Urban Transport Administration, shall make sure that Gothenburg takes advantages of the rapid transition that now is happening in the transport sector. It shall also make sure that Gothenburg continues to keep a lead position in the field. And the strategy shall promote, and we shall promote, traffic innovations that create value for those who live, stay, work, and move around in our city. 
And the strategy discloses what innovation focus we need to have during the next three years. And now we have built a project portfolio in order to meet this focus. Uh, and the focus when it comes to electrification, I think everybody know we need to reduce climate impact. It will lower the levels of harmful noise and emissions. So everybody is trying to electrify the transport system, but it is not easy. So we continue using our electricity collaboration to learn more and develop solutions together with academy, with the business, uh, with loads of stakeholders. And now we look at ferries, we look at heavy commercial trucks, work and construction machinery. We kind of we are quite a, kind of finished with the buses. Um, and the ongoing digitalization in combination with technical development has as we all talk about a potential and know probably a potential to fundamentally change the transport system as we know it. And this digital development is not only paving the way for a completely new mobility and transport services, but it also implicates changed conditions for how road maintenance authorities like us at the Urban Transport Administration operate. So, in the strategy, we focus on developing services based on data sharing and digitized uh, working methods, uh, developing usage of services based on the geofencing technology, but also develop visualization as a viable tool and method for city planning. And we use our virtual Gothenburg lab platform and digital twin. And Tamara, could you, is, it, is it possible to, to wait a little bit with the, with the slide? With the picture? Am I off? No. Still on, Marlene. You can go on. Okay. So. Go on, perfect. <laughs> no, I continue. Our focus concerning the automation is that, well, future automated mobility has the potential to solve many of today's traffic challenges, but it can also result in increased traffic flows and congestion. So therefore, it's important that the administration follow the development in the, this field pretty closely. And we do that by participating in tests, demonstrations, and, we, and by doing that, we learn and we can evaluate how automation can be utilized in our operation and thus be beneficial for the city. So when it comes to automation, we are proactive. We allow safe tests with self-driving vehicles in city environments. And uh, because we, we learn so much through these tests, uh, but there are also currently no really formal requirements or guidelines for the design of physical infrastructure. And that can support the automated driving systems, the IT technique, for example. So we take part in CCAM on this topic. And then we have system effects, public acceptance, traffic behavior, which is, of course, very important to study and to regard when it comes to automation. So, <clears throat> but, so we have pretty clear targets within those areas. But to be innovative, you cannot only depend on creativity and clear targets. It's, it requires a long-term perspective and perseverance. So therefore you must also shape dedicated and systematic working methods. So our strategy also contains principles that we have uh, developed along the way. It explains <clears throat> different roles the administration can take in different um, collaborations. It talks about the juridical considera <coughs> considerations and dilemmas we have when it comes to new uh, features and solutions. It stresses the importance of systematic benchmarking that makes you bet on the right horse, so to speak. But it also has our principles for financing, how we prioritize a uh, project and how we finance when it's risky projects. Uh, and also it describes the test bed recommendations for living labs in the city. And maybe the most important thing in the strategy is to avoid working alone. Therefore, we care for very broad collaboration with different stakeholders within the city, with business, 
uh, with the research, academia, citizens, and we spend quite a lot of time uh, on collaboration platforms and in networks like Polis, it's a brilliant one. Um, and then we learn from other, uh, we learn other perspectives, other stakeholders' perspectives. And after a time working together, we get a pretty impressive collaboration capacity. And that has matured around us. Um, so to conclude, uh, everybody, and you started with that, um, Tamara, you want to reach upscale, you want to reach implementation. And here's the picture of the socio-technical system. Uh, because we are working, the transport system is a socio-technical system. And therefore, we need to have a system approach when trying to implement new solutions. Um, and if you have that, it, it uh, facilitates uh, the implementation greatly. Um, because obstacles in implementation usually, it usually get stuck somewhere in all those words in this cloud. Uh, because there are stakeholders uh, who suddenly got the mandate to transform the system and perhaps they are not taking part, not even taking part in the project. So put the stakeholder that has got the mandate to transform, put them in the center of the project. So in this social technical system, there are a lot of people with completely different perspectives and they don't usually meet. Uh, it could concern return on investments, aftermarket, fuel distribution, standards, maintenance, and so forth. So forth. And to, as long as the project evolves, also new business models appear, thus new stakeholders. And that, this, I think, must be re analyzed through the project development if you want to reach implementation. So to conclude this, uh, Find your absolutely most important stakeholders in the social technical system and enjoy them and bring them to the project. But finally, however systematic or target driven you make your innovation strategy and you work with innovation, it all comes down to the very, very dedicated people that works with innovation. So they, I mean, they push boundaries on a daily basis. So do everything that you possibly can to help them come through with their ideas and don't burn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malin. Uh, always really inspiring to hear what you always do in Gutenberg. It's so impressive. And uh, today I learned it's not only about good ideas and creativity, but also on long-term long systematic working principles. So uh, I think my city, we can, we can learn something from that, uh, from you. So thank you very much. And then now I can invite uh, the next speaker, and that is uh, Miriam Koopman from the province of Gelderland. And Miriam will inform us uh, in her speech uh, towards a networking governance model for development and innovation in the domain of mobility. So Miriam. Thank you, Tamara. Yeah. Yes, um, next slide is my slide. Um, and it tells a bit about what we're trying to do with uh, building a network governance model. Um, as I said, as uh, Tamara said, my name is Miriam Koopman and I work at the province of Gelderland um, on smart mobility projects. And the first challenge I faced uh, when preparing this talk is finding the right word in English for the, uh, the, the work I do. Because I'm a regisseur um, and the direct trans translation of that term in English is director. And director suggests that you're the boss of something or like a film director. Are, um, and you have a script in mind and you're guiding, um, telling actors what to do. But the, the work I do has more to do with overseeing the field in which you are bringing about um, um, the right connections between different stakeholders. It's more about co-directing, influencing and being an intermediary. And when I learned I was part of this NMS session, I wondered why first, because we are not an NMS partner. But then I read about the challenges the NMS partners face in their work, like bringing theory into practice, multi-stakeholder approaches, learning by doing, and especially involving local authorities. That's what we are working on in the project that I will use today. 
as an example of our network approach to realize innovation in mobility. And this project is the digitization of mobility data by provincial and local road authorities. Because for innovation in urban mobility, it's important that local road authorities organize open digital access to their mobility data. And in order to do so, they need to become digitally competent. Road authorities play a critical role um, in collecting and providing access to data about traffic regulations, for example, parking, road construction. And that's why the Dutch national governments and the provinces have agreed to organize this digitization in the coming three years. And for Gelderland, this means as a road authority, we ourselves have to digitize our own mobility data, but we also have to stimulate and coordinate the same challenge in over 50 road authorities. And this presents us with a number of organizational challenges. For example, um, a number of technical standards still have to be developed. And the costs and benefits of the operation are not evenly divided. Most road authorities um, have the feeling that they um, have the costs and the difficulties in organizing this access and service providers have the profits from it. And local road authorities are dealing, dealing with severe, severe budget cuts and they may have other policy priorities. In the recent past, there have been several attempts to digitize local mobility data and a lot of these attempts have failed because it appeared that the project results were not sustainable over time and the data quality lowered. And it's our analysis that, because, that this is because there has been too much attention on the what and the operational level and too little attention for the why and how in which all stakeholders can have their say. Because when discussing these letter, a lot of questions, you can adjust goals and strengthen networks. So we started this project with the help of an experienced process regisseur named Willem van Santer. And he is specialized in the, in the organization of complex collaboration processes. So not in digitization per se. With that digitization is often an important part of complex collaboration, but it's almost never the objective. Better cooperation is. So together with Willem, we initiated our project this spring by organizing, organizing exploratory discussions with regional and, and municipal governments. And we have organiz organized this process with the municipalities in five or six regions in our province. We have six regions um, which have quite different profiles from one another and the municipalities can work together in these regions. And together with these regions, we worked on a raise in awareness on cultural change and ultimately the development of processes and procedures that go beyond the boundaries of the individual organizations. And we try to assure uh, cooperation on all levels of the organizations. We work bottom up and top down. Top down because at the end of the three years, we have to make sure that all the road authorities digitize 15 data items, which we have um, um, formulated at front, but bottom up because we allow for regional differences in the way they organize it and the priorities they make. So um, these priorities, they may differ um, depending on the characteristics of the region and the regional agenda. And also um, um, ways to, um, to make a more efficient collaboration between the municipalities to make have effective approach of digitization were an important part of the conversations. And now we are at the stage that we have come to an agreement with most regions on a preferred regional approach on priorities and cooperation. And two uh, examples of the way they differ is that in the Food Valley region, this project is incorporated in a project of constructing a regional traffic desk, which works on the prioritized use cases such as road safety, for example. And another region, our most rural region, the Achtelhoek region, um, is a region in which Triple Helix partners work together on close-knit mobility systems. So they prioritize their digitization accordingly. And of course, um, our um, provincial and regional activities have to be aligned with other provinces and with the national level. And for this purpose, we have together with the province of Overijssel, um, 
together created or formed a regional digitalization team which helps the, the, road, the local governance governments um, with process information and technical information for example and the role um, we play as a province has to do with the picture as shown it's making sure we make vital connections are being made in a sustainable manner so that way we try to work towards building sustainable network relations and the lessons we learned in doing this is that first as i said you have to widen the scope to the why and how and um, involve uh, more participants more stakeholders but after that you have to help the regions also to to narrowing the scope again and to define concrete st steps and small projects so they can go ahead with this great challenge in small steps and that's why all regions have decided to work with six, six months action plans with a limited scope and limited number of participations of participants so every six months um, they they try they define the, the actions for the next six months it's also important to focus on improving the way they work together in an efficient way how can they make sure that not everyone is dealing with the same problems but they can divide um, the burden um, it's important to be flexible and to allow for regional differences but make work actively on making the connections so that the different initiatives um, meet each other at the end um, and it's also important to connect the strategic and policy ambitions to the concrete project goal goals in the area of digitization and last but not least it's important to develop network governance gradually uh, we have learned that governance has a natural tendency to create uh, to create organization and consultation structures uh, at the start of projects such as this um, these structures and procedures are needed for inter internal decision making and, and helpful for allocation of capacity and money. But they stand in the way of gaining trust, organizing uh, flexibility and innovation. And this digitization effort can only succeed when every participant can get something relevant out of it. And they need time to define their own wins in relation to the cost they will make to, make, to do so. And doing so and talking about this will lead to proper arrangements for governments so you have to let it evolve uh, in time and this demands for a postponement of decision making by the central actor um, we had really to, to explain why uh, we didn't start with building uh, consultation structures um, and it also demands for a flexible approach and the willingness of management to um, adjust goals and plans and collaborate in cross-boundary change. So structures should be the results and not the start of the process and of development and innovation. So we hope this project helps and you see it as a step in the development of broader mobility network in which partners trust each other and try to win, uh, reach win-win situations and collectively aim for higher order effects. That was my speech. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Uh, it was really interesting to hear. And for me also, um, I was really triggered about your approach uh, to help the regions in digitalization and the six months actions plan. I think uh, this can be helpful for my own region and probably also for a lot of other regions. So thank you very much. Thank you. And then I would like to invite the next speaker. Uh, that is Sarah Tori, and I also would have a reminder for everyone in the session that you can leave your questions in the chat session on the right and then uh, go to the uh, session chat and we will uh, answer all this question after the first uh, four speakers. So now the floor is for Sarah Tori and she will uh, inform us about the Sprout approach. Uh, yes, thanks Tamara. So good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah and after traveling to the Netherlands, I will take you to Spain through the image that you see on your screen. But not just to Spain, I'm taking you to the Spain of the future. So follow me as we travel to 2030. So we're in Valencia, the year is 2030 and the city has been transformed by COVID-19. We can see that workers telework a lot more and so there's a lot less traffic in the city. We can also see that there are a lot of last mile delivery vehicles and e-lockers in the city because e-commerce has strongly taken off as a result of the pandemic that started in 2020. The vehicles that can be seen are electric 
So there's a lot of reduction in air and noise pollution. However, the city has been hit by an economic recession, so a lot of cafes and shops are closed. But as a result, we can see that Valencians have started to bike. So the city has developed an extensive network of separate bike lanes. In order to comply with social distancing measures even further, there are also grown pedestrianized areas to be seen, like the ones in between the cafes in the back. So now let's get back to 2020. What I have just described to you is a scenario for the city of Valencia for 2030, and it has been developed as part of the SPRAP project. The SPRAP project aims to generate innovative policy responses to the challenges that are presented by the emergence of digitally enabled business models and new mobility patterns in cities all over. We can see that previously tested and implemented policy responses seem unable to adequately address the changes underway in the urban mobility scene. Furthermore, a lot of the policy response should take into account all stages of the policy life cycle and should have an eye not only to the present, but also to the future. So the spread approach is city-led, and it is based on the concept of cities cooperating with the aim of building an appropriate response towards the urban mobility transition. So the way it works in Sprout is that this cooperation translates in a three-layer structure. We have five pilot cities, nine validation cities, and 25 associated cities. The pilot cities each look at likely impacts and operational feasibility of new mobility solutions. They then identify pilot areas where policy interventions will be needed, and we can then test and validate the pilot solutions. Our validation cities contribute to the revision of one or more of the pilot solution, thereby ensuring that the findings are more generally applicable. The third layer cities will use the project tools and contribute to the project dissemination activities. So, so far we're a year and a half into the project and we have been mostly focused on understanding transitions in urban mobility, in determining the impacts of emerging urban mobility environments and setting up and launching the pilots in the pilot cities of Valencia, Kalis, Budapest, Padova and Tel Aviv. So our first main project result that we obtained was the development of the scenarios such as the one I described to you. These are scenarios for the future of urban mobility under the assumption of no policy intervention by the year 2030. For each of our cities, we developed three scenarios, two that were very opposed, so describing very different futures, and one that was deemed most likely as by the stakeholders in the cities. So the aim of this is to use the scenarios as or these alternative views of the future to help prepare for the future. So what we did was we developed scenarios in a way that is fully participatory from beginning to end, and it is both quantitative and qualitative. The first part is based on what's called cross-impact balance analysis, which is embedded in systems thinking and is used for the development of qualitative and semi-quantitative scenarios. So we looked at factors influencing either directly or indirectly the subject being examined, so in our case, transformations in urban mobility. Then we look at how these factors influence each other, and this can be anything from tourism to electrification to automation or um, to climate change. And then based on that, we, we developed what are called consistent scenarios. So this is very important because these are scenarios that do not contain any internal contradictions and that are therefore plausible. Important here is the word plausible because it doesn't say anything about how likely something is, only that it is possible. The factors used in the scenario development were selected in the cities by the stakeholders in order to make sure that they would be very city specific and very specific to the context of the city. After this cross impact balance analysis, the cities organized workshops to understand the impacts of the different factors on the urban mobility. And then we had raw scenarios that we subjected to policy and sustainability impact analyses. And as a last step, the cities organized other scenario writing workshops with creative methods with their stakeholders in order to develop the final narratives. And then based on these final narratives, we developed the visualizations such as the one that you can see on the screen. So based on our experience, we can say that the scenario building approach is extremely useful tool to support tr transport planning in city, especially if it is participatory and creative because it really involves your stakeholders and they know best what the local context is. Um, but as a next step in the project, we have now launched, we're launching the pilots in the different cities. And by the spring of 2021, we will have formulated city specific innovative policy responses um, and by autumn, we will have developed these or we will have broadened these uh, innovative policy responses with a wider applicability than only um, the pilots. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, 
Yes, here I am again. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for your clear presentation. Um, and for all the attendees, I really would like you to go now to the uh, chat session because there uh, is a link to find more information about uh, the Sprout uh, project. And uh, for the questions, uh, we come back to you after the uh, presentation of Florinda. So Florinda, could you please join the session right now? And Florinda Boschetti is uh, head of the City Club of the EIT Urban Mobility. Florinda. Uh, learn us more about the city club florina we cannot hear you i think you i cannot hear, hear you now yes yes fabulous i was saying tamara thank you for inviting me as a speaker today to your session and to all the attendees my name is florinda uh, boschetti after having been for eight years on the organizer side of the police uh, conference as a senior manager. I'm coming back this year as a, a speaker uh, with a new hat as a head of City Club of the EIT Urban Mobility Knowledge and Innovation Community. Urban mobility is one of the latest knowledge and innovation communities which have been launched in 2019 by the European Institute for Innovation and Technology. This is an initiative which counts already some 130 partners in uh, 20 countries which are organized around five uh, Euro pan-European innovation hubs. As the name of the kick uh, uh, says, urban mobility aims at accelerating the transition to a more sustainable urban mobility system and livable urban spaces, while also at the same time supporting the competitiveness of the European transport sector. It's really an initiative focusing on innovation in transport more than on uh, the research side on innovation projects. Now, the impact that we intend to make with the uh, cities in, uh, in, uh, in the kick is to really leverage the transport innovation that we have in the uh, ecosystem locally to improve the way we move around uh, in, in cities and we have seen how important it is to be more resilient transport system during these difficult uh, times we are living in. We also want to foster mobility solutions that protect health and the environment, support public transport as a backbone of the transport system of the city and maintain high service levels and efficiency. And most importantly, really at the core of this initiative is about a better design and management of road space, freeing up road space from moving and uh, still um, uh, vehicles and bringing as much as possible public life back to city streets. So they are very ambitious objectives there and cities are really at the core of uh, this initiative. They are part of what we have uh, named the city club that I'm coordinating, which is the community of the local governments that share a powerful, powerful vision for the future of cities, for sustainable mobility, and livability. So the cities together with uh, the partners in the KICA are developing and co-creating innovation with their local mobility systems and with the citizens. That's very important. Citizens engagement is a core element of the initiative and we are supporting this uh, through local demonstration projects and living labs. So we're launching next year a network of living labs supporting the deployment, testing and trialing of mobility solution in living lab settings. And this uh, also support uh, further upscaling of innovation and entering the market for new solutions. So the way the kick is working with the cities, you have already understood, it's about what we call the quadruple helix uh, innovation framework. It's about connecting local governments, cities, towns, metropolitan areas, directly with a wide range of partners from the private sector, research community, education institutes and innovators. So those promising startups and accelerators that are coming up with plentiful uh, ideas for improving mobility and, uh, and transport. So the kick is also building these uh, synergies and offering a complementary support to help cities achieve their mobility goals. And we're trying to enhance the innovation capacity of local governments. Uh, to conclude uh, on my intervention, Tamara, all together with all the partners were there to tackle the most pressing uh, challenges that the cities are facing. And these specific challenges we have uh, collected among uh, our uh, founding cities. We have 12 uh, cities 
Taiwan is one of them. We will be scoping out these challenges in the coming months, in the coming years, understanding what gaps and barriers cities are facing to meet their uh, mobility goals, uh, how best uh, the key instruments can help in uh, overcoming those barriers and challenges. Now, we're working around nine challenge areas. I'm naming them because they will be uh, objects of the next uh, call for projects that we're launching in uh, 2021, uh, around the end of February. So we're working in these nine thematic areas, being active mobility, sustainable city logistics, multimodality, creating public room, as I said, an uh, important focus on public space and public life in city streets, air pollution, inclusive mobility for all, mobility infrastructure, mobility and energy, so the transition to more uh, green and clean uh, vehicles and future mobility. So as I said, we're launching the call in um, end of winter next year. We'll be hosting some info days to introduce the call uh, text, but also some matchmaking events for stakeholders and cities who are interested in joining up forces in new innovation projects uh, citizens' engagement projects, business creation, and much uh, more. So that's all from my side. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Florinda. And um, we see already some questions in the uh, chat session. So I would like also to ask uh, Marlin, Miriam, and Sarah to join me uh, to join me again on stage to answer the questions. Um, well, uh, I will start with uh, the last question, and that was a question from uh, Sarah, and there was a question for, uh, the question is for Miriam, and the question is, as the project of data digitalization seems to be mandated for the whole country, who ends up owning the data? Is it open access across the different organizations or, and or agencies? Yes. Well, I think that's still subject of deliberation on a national level. We are uh, talking, uh, there's now discussions on a, uh, a central uh, uh, point of entry for all mobility data on a national level. And I think uh, there still has to be decided on the governance and um, uh, whether it will be open access or not. I'm not sure, but I, I, I think a lot of it will be open access. access. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Miriam. Uh, then we have a question from Marlin to Sarah. And um, well, the question is, did you start the scenarios before the pandemic? Uh, and if so, uh, did you uh, totally change direction or did the pandemic uh, only help to prioritize? So thanks, Marlin. That's a really, good, really great question. Um, so we started the full process before the pandemic, which was catalog like uh, making a catalog of the different factors, just inventorying whatever could poten potentially influence. And then the city selected those. So that was already done before the pandemic. And we had actually the raw scenarios before the pandemic as well. Um, so we did actually that was really interesting because we then kept developing them with the sustainability and policy impact analysis during the pandemic we had to move online through surveys our actual actually our scenario writing workshops were held online as well which was an interesting experience um but basically we all we asked when we developed the final narratives we asked the cities to review them and to see whether or not they saw COVID influencing in a particular way. And the reason I picked the example of Valencia is that beca is because the stakeholders themselves during the workshops decided that their most likely scenario, because this was their, their most likely scenario, was not going to be representative anymore of the situation by 2030. So they really took charge of that scenario and made the changes with regards to teleworking and with regards to city densification. They saw it as less densified and more urban sprawl due to the pandemic. So they really took charge. But then the other cities, when we made only minor changes to their scenarios with regards to the effects of COVID. So I thought that was really interesting because on the one hand, we had the city that really saw it as a big influence and as a big change, game changer. And then the other cities saw it more as minor things in the sense that probably the future would still look the way they thought it would. And this pandemic was only maybe something that would have automation go 
faster or electrification go faster. So that's kind of how it went. Super interesting, that is. Thank you very much, Sarah. Then we have a question for uh, from Miriam to Malin. Um, and uh, can you give an example of the principles you formulated? For example, principles that guide your financial decisions. And how did these principles come about? I'm really interested in that myself. So, <laughs> Malin. Yeah, but when we started to work uh, together in the city and look at this from, from different administrations and also companies within the city, we realized that we had uh, we were uh, with the Swedish innovation system is that uh, when someone do research, they want they really want to attract uh, people working within the public sector and within administrations. And we were very willing to just give away our time. So they asked us, can you join our project? And we said, yeah, we can do that. Uh, and that means that we took part in an enormous amount of projects, but we never really got any finance for that. So we had tried to change that uh, way around to say, and well, we, uh, we get a lot of questions to join different projects and when they ask us, uh, we we uh, prioritize and say, well, uh, we want to join, this is uh, important for us, uh, but we want also to have part of the financing, so we can't join for free. So we have totally changed um, our figures, our economical figures in this, and that goes also with a uh, much better economical structure uh, to be able to share and um, write down your time, what you spend your time on, and make that in a um, systematic approach within the economical system that we have uh, at the administration. So that is quite a heavy job to, to make that structure. But it also, um, we, we also gain that we don't really risk the citizens' money, because many of those uh, innovation uh, innovation projects are really seeking goal seeking processes, uh, and some may turn out good, and some may not turn out in a good way. Uh, and if they don't turn out in a good way, we have kind of wasted the citizens' tax money, right? So, and our national system and also the uh, EU system provides us with these kind of risk money and we just need to be good at gaming them. So we try to put up that uh, in the city as a whole, but also at my administration, so that we really engage a lot of people at the, in the administration, but also so uh, they don't work for free for the researchers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malin. Then we have uh, a question for Marilyn uh, van Gruithuizen for Florinda. And the question is, collaboration is key to the project. Uh, question, you mentioned the strategy co-creation. How do you make sure it is not co-production? How do you safeguard co-creation? Second question, Problem in my research on co-creation in governance is that the problem of over representation of specific groups of citizens and as a result, homogeneity of values. How do you overcome this problem? This question is for Florinda. Thank you for reading out the question for, uh, for me. Uh, it, it's a very relevant question. So the KIC is a very young initiative. We are building the strategies. We only launched last year the first uh, round of innovation projects. We're also learning a lot. two important questions. I think it's talk of your direct experience, uh, Nigel, and, and, and bring this forward in the strategy. So we are uh, looking at how to use the living lab settings, so the five key elements of a living lab with strong uh, citizens engagement, multimodal. Uh, sorry, uh, multi-stakeholder approach, multi-methodology approach as well, in, in the, and have a balanced representation of values, interest. It's not easy, definitely we are there to learn uh, as well, so your point uh, makes total sense to me, but I don't have right now the, the answer. We need to probably uh, deep dive into the second and business plan of the KIC, uh, having new uh, 
situation and really um, understand the functioning of the living labs. What we're currently doing, we, are, uh, we have outsourced a study to understand the framework conditions for the living labs to enable innovation, um, to understand how different interests and values can interact in um, co-creating uh, values and co-creating solutions, uh, uh, how to make collaboration work. So by taking stock of this uh, study and understand how the, uh, the key partnership is working in living lab conditions, we'll be able maybe to answer this question next year. So I would uh, love to hear back uh, from, uh, from you next year. And um, I, I really don't have the answer right now, but thank you. Well, thank you, Florinda. I hope then uh, we can see each other in uh, real life next year, and then uh, you could answer the question. It's an interesting question. So now I want to invite Edwin to the stage for a wrap up of this first uh, part of uh, this smart city and smart governance session here. Edwin is already there. So the speakers can now leave. And before Edwin is going to uh, start speaking, I want also everyone to look at the polls because there are polls still open. So thank you all. And Edwin, what? Uh, did you think about the first uh, the first four speakers? A lot. I was uh, very impressed, uh, um, and it was also what I hoped for. Uh, really inspiring uh, stories, and uh, some of them uh, uh, I heard earlier about, of course. But uh, I heard a lot of new things, and um, uh, what all the speakers share, uh, of course, is. Uh, uh, that it is about learning by doing. Uh, this is a, a struggle. We don't have clear answers. Uh, otherwise, uh, we would have another job right now because then the problem was solved. Uh, uh, this is about uh, bringing all stakeholders uh, together, including the citizens, uh, and start working uh, and make mistakes and learn from that and share these mistakes. Uh, and then also bring uh, what does work uh, further um what i heard also was uh, in my terms also the this mission oriented approach or uh, you could say uh, define a moonshot uh, sarah uh, uh, expressed that uh, about looking at the future uh, what we are doing this transformation to more sustainable uh, mobility system uh, is a moonshot uh, it is like bringing a man to the moon it takes a long time uh, you have to define the ambition and then start working uh, uh, to it. And that, that is what we are, are doing. Um, and it inspires me because no one has the answer. So everyone is trying uh, things and we have to learn from that uh, better than now. And uh, of course, in these times of Corona, <laughs> it is on screen. But uh, well, all of you, you know that the best learning is in uh doing things together uh, in real life do things together and uh in the real world with uh, citizens at the forefront uh, that's another uh um uh, thing what uh, i heard in most uh, uh, presentations um involve the end user and that is also extremely i can uh, tell from our region also extremely uh, different uh, it's so easy to work with experts from government and universities and companies and bring solutions to the market. Uh, uh, but it is so important to have this user-centric uh, design and uh, that, that's what I also liked in uh, your stories. I could talk for much more, but uh, my five minutes are over. Uh, see you uh, after the next uh, round. Thank you, Thank, you for, Thank you very Thank much, you. Martin. Um, I hear, uh, Edwin, can you close your micro? Because I hear an echo. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Then uh, now it's time for the uh, second set of uh, speakers. And the first speaker is Anna Domenech Albella. And um, she was chairing uh, the IMED initiative. And uh, she will share with us our uh, lessons learned. Uh, yeah. Welcome, Anna. Thank you, Tamara. So, Today, the most important thing I want to share with you is, yeah, what are my lessons learned after almost four years leading the IMED initiative? Well, for, for those of you that are not familiar with the initiative, IMED stands for Intelligent Mobility for Energy Transition. 
and it uh, focuses on those solutions that enable the integration of the electric vehicles into the grid. Like for instance, B2G, which um, enables the vehicles to send energy back to the grid, or second life batteries that can be used as stationary energy storage systems. That's basically what we mean by um, intelligent mobility. Uh, we are as, um, a group of, uh, well, a pan-European network of smart city stakeholders that have gathered together in order to jointly develop intelligent mobility solutions and also to guide public authorities on how to create a friendly environment for the market uptake of these solutions. Our key message is that intelligent mobility will make or will uh, make become the um, electric vehicles a great tool to uh, not only decarbonize the, the mobility system, but also to decarbonize the energy system. So we are not only speaking about mobility here, energy is, uh, is very important. Um, how? Because electric vehicles uh, can provide further flexibility to the grid, uh, thanks to their storage capacity. And this uh, higher flexibility will also enable uh, the integration of more renewable energy sources into the grid and it will mean that our system will be greener and also more resilient. Well, that's uh, all I wanted to say uh, to give some background and now I, I will focus on the lessons learned. It will be a lot about collaboration, uh, so it's very much in line with the presentations you have already already uh, listened to, but well, it's focused on, on uh, my area, which is intelligent mobility. First lesson learned is it was a very good idea to structure the collaboration uh, in the network in two layers, national uh, level and pan-European level. At national level, we had um, a series of uh, ambassadors uh, in nine countries that were uh, promoting demonstrator projects locally. And then at pan-European level, we were collaborating with great networks such as Polis Network or Euro Electric or Avir that provided us with a wider perspective and also helped a lot in spreading out our messages. Thanks to all this very well structured network, we could um, gather many stakeholders in the preparation and dissemination of the messages of our white paper on intelligent mobility that we launched last year. But in addition, we were able to participate in many demonstrator projects across Europe. Among all these projects, we have selected um, 10 flagship projects that are to be used as a showcase of how the technology works, and what are the benefits for the citizens of these technologies, and what are the business models that we can all uh, enjoy, or at least that we, we can all um, achieve. Um, with, um, the, after analyzing all these flagship projects, we have um, elaborated a final report that summarizes all the lessons learned from the projects and also sets additional recommendations for um, policymakers and regulators to help them uh, creating this very necessary friendly environment that we need for the market uptake of the solutions. Um, this report will be published uh, in the next few days on the Smart Cities Marketplace website. Uh, but today, I want to summarize what are my conclusions after having finalized the white paper on intelligent mobility and also this final report that will be published soon. Um, first of all, um, there are many challenges that intelligent mobility solutions face that are not so original or so specific to intelligent mobility. They are more specific to um, innovation. Um, in this sense, the market is very immature, as always happens, or most of the times happens with innovative solutions. It means that there is a lack of availability of the technology. Technology is expensive. Uh, there are compatibility issues with the ancillary devices. Uh, regulation is not really friendly because it's not yet ready. And uh, well, because of all of that, collaboration is very much needed. Uh, we need joint investments and we need uh, co-development of standards in order to allow the scale up and replication of the solutions. 
But there are other, other um, challenges that are more specific to, to intelligent mobility. And it's because intelligent mobility merges to very complex sectors, which is urban mobility and the energy market. Um, this complexity needs to be uh, faced through collaboration as well. I will put a, an example. We need uh, private stakeholders to guide the public authorities uh, in this new world, in this new market, uh, for them to be able to set the specific measures we need uh, to make it possible. But the other way around is also very important. Public authorities need to guide public and private stakeholders in order for them to be able to adapt the solutions to the local needs. And here, the involvement of the citizen is very important, as um, the previous speaker already said. Um, and actually, that again is not so specific to intelligent mobility, because the key to success for every business is customer focus, as we know. Well, that's all I wanted to say right now, but I am looking forward to participate in the panel discussion later. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anna. And um, very interesting to learn already some insights uh, when the report is still not, uh, yeah, it's still not there. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And I'm looking forward for the, uh, yeah, to the report showing in the coming uh, days. And next speaker, I would like to invite uh, to enter the stage, and that's Theo Thijs from Q Park and APA. Hello, Theo. Yeah, hello, everybody. Good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having this uh, opportunity to uh, to present this survey on curbside management. So this summer, the uh, team of NMS. Uh, took the initiative to pay more attention to shared use mobility zones. We summarize it as the curbside. Uh, so also on behalf of POLIS, uh, EPA and ALICE, with the support of uh, UITP, uh, FIT and the Erasmus University, we are collecting now information to define the next steps in managing public space uh, along the roads, the curbside in, in urban areas. Uh, already, uh, many cities have uh, implemented new zoning plans uh, the last couple of years. Uh, uh, COVID-19 has uh, speeded up these, these plans, but it will not be enough. Uh, that's at least our statement. So big, uh, medium-sized uh, and uh, also small cities do still have a lack of public space in their respective inner cities. So we're all focusing on less car trips, uh, less on-street parking capacity, and uh, how to deal with uh, new challenges in urban logistics, uh, EV charging points, micro-mobility, uh, bicycle lanes, uh, parking uh, bicycles, more green and meeting places in public space uh, at the curbside uh, in a more sustainable way. So all these stakeholders are uh, fighting for time and, and space in a very restricted area in, in, in cities. Um, so in the Polish newsletter of last week, uh, Thursday, uh, November 26th, uh, the survey with the link has already been announced. And the uh, first results will be presented at the Polish EPA Alice working session on uh, December 17th this year already uh, where we are organizing a session about flexible access and um, and uh, space management so uh, please you're all kindly invited to share your ideas experiences and already implemented curbside projects we are looking for the next steps uh, in organizing more and better public spaces in uh, inner cities so thank you very much in advance and the link, uh, the survey link uh, is here on this slide, but is also in the Polish newsletter of last week. And uh, Edwin will now uh, distribute the link in the, in the chat box. So thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Theo. And uh, I will again invite everyone to uh, complete the survey. I think it's really interesting uh, uh, what you are working on. And um, in the chat, you find the link uh, to the survey. And uh, please all have a look on the poll. Uh, we already still have some poll questions over there. And the first question is really an easy one. And uh, how would you describe yourself? And I see that 70% of us is uh, from government, local, regional, national, and or European. So I'm really curious about, um, yeah, the rest of the poll questions and their outcomes. So please, when we change speakers, go all to the poll and um, yeah, already complete some of the questions. Then, now I invite the next speaker, and that's Daniela de Boer from Fontes University, and she is uh, leading the NMS Working Group on Urban Freight Transport. And yeah, there's Daniela. Thank you, Tamara. Um, Danielle de Boer. Uh, I'm currently uh, not at Fontes University of Applied Science, but uh, at Smart Logistics Center Venlo. And uh, I'm the lead of uh, the work group Urban Freight. And the Urban Freight work group has uh, partners now, is partnering up with the Polis and also with the European Network of Living Labs to, uh, to strengthen the capacity building of ecosystems that are involved with the uh, last mile solutions, uh, transport and mobility, even the cross-sectoral solutions um, into uh, the city for urban uh, logistics. And we are working together now with uh, the mobility cluster to find good examples. Uh, those were from former projects of European Commission, uh, City Lab projects, Novelog projects, and success. These are either city labs uh, ecosystems working together on solutions um, or on multi stakeholder decision making or on building um, uh, where they work multi stakeholder. And uh, we're now scouting out all these good projects to see where there are uh, forerunners and followers and how we could work towards uh, an idea to upscale these ecosystems. So uh, we found a lot of uh, projects already in um, these uh, former projects of European Commission, but we are more lo looking also for other ecosystems or sometimes they are called freight quality partnerships um, to, to expand the reach of impact. Um, what Edwin Mara already said, it, this uh, NMS is not about technology push. It's also about social innovation, about reuse of space, uh, about thinking differently uh, about the city's dimension and, and creative solutions with the stakeholders. So um, if you want to team up with this um, uh, cluster, uh, which is bigger than only MS, so it also involves the uh, Urban uh, Freight Work Group of Polis and uh, the European Network of Living Labs action-oriented uh, um, cluster for um, uh, mobility, um, please email me and you can join um, our uh, strategy for the coming years. We're preparing for a few things. We're preparing for Horizon 2020 latest Green Deals now and also for Horizon Europe, of course, and the Green Deal. So um, happy to have more um, uh, people on board with this. So email me and I will get you into the network. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, we will go to the next uh, speaker and then we will come back with possible questions um, after the last speaker. So thank you, Daniela. Then Jesus, um, you can join uh, the stage now. And Jesus uh, de la Cotana, he works from Technalia and he will uh, inform us about uh, adequate policy and regulation and uh, excellent governance for new mobility services. And uh, I'm really curious when I look at uh, the picture you have here. So, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Lovely. Uh, my name is Jesus de la Quintana. I am head of urban solutions at Technalia. 
Uh, Tecnalia is the largest private research organization in Spain. It's located in the Basque Country. And also, I coordinate this group about policies, regulations, and governance. Um, answering your question, Tamara, uh, the new needs trends. Um, from the excellent motion picture by Pixar Studios, and with your permission, 